You're listening to a 4x4, 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the G-Talk Show with G-Mama, Josh, and Tony. So sit back, strap in, and brace yourself. This episode of the Jeep Talk Show is brought to you by LT Wright Knives. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventure, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LTWK. Find out more online at ltwrightknives.com, and that's right with a W. Hey, it doesn't matter if you uh, have a Jeep, want a Jeep, or never driven anything but Jeeps. This show is for you. Josh, Tammy, and myself are here to inform and entertain you while we talk about Jeeps. Hey, I'm Tony. I bought my first Jeep in 1998 or thereabouts, and many mods later, it's still my daily driver between me and a friend. It's been my daily driver for 20 years. Hey, my name is Josh, and I like waffles. Tasty, tasty waffles. Oh, yes. With lots of maple syrup. Hey, and I'm Tammy, a Jeep blogger, Jeep vlogger, slash YouTuber, and a Jeep podcaster, a.k.a. Jeep Mama. Hey, uh, Tony, what's coming up on this episode? <laughs> you had to kind of spin the wheel there for the name, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> I know, exactly. Like, <laughs> well, Tammy, on this episode, we're going to have a new Jeeper and fan of the show, Shody, joins us to talk about a very nasty rollover wreck he recently suffered in his Jeep. This Week in Jeep uh, has us talking about the legality surrounding the wannabe Jeep, the Mahindra Roxor, and we hear why FCA may be writing a very large check here soon. Wrangler Talk has the top five, yes, yes, the top five is back, basic fundamental Yay. tips for off-roading, and Nikki G's going to talk to us about retreads, and of course, we're going to have much, much more. Local Jeep news, national Jeep news, and news from around the world, it's This Week in Jeep. And This Week in Jeep is brought to you by Amazon.com. Hey, it's a new year, and we got new ways for you guys to support the show, but all, all sorts of ways. It's uh, always best to defer to the best. Now, we got the JeepTalkShow.com slash contact website, and you can go there and find out all the ways you can reach out to us. But the Amazon button right there is what you want to click on. If you're going to be doing any shopping at all, it's the best way to help support the show because anything you use or buy purchasing uh, using that button will uh, go to help support the show. And, well, thanks in advance. FCA is in hot water with the EPA, and, uh, well, it's not really all that good. Fiat Chrysler Automobiles has long denied any intentional wrongdoing in its alleged diesel cheating scandal. But federal authorities made clear this morning that they believe the automaker actively deceived regulators and the public for years by announcing a settlement in the case. As part of the settlement, owners of the affected vehicles will be eligible for cash payments that could total more than $3,000. Acting U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Andrew Wheeler claims that, quote, not only did FCA violate the law, they also tried to hide their actions. He went on to explain that the EPA engineers had a monumental challenge in weeding through more than 100 million lines of computer code to uncover the cheating. By comparison, he said a brand new Boeing 787 has only about 14 million lines of code. Wow. Between approximately 400 million in civil penalties and extended warranty, A proposed class action action legal settlement and other costs, the Italian automaker is expected to spend more than about $790 million to resolve the cheating allegations involving approximately 100,000 2014 to 2016 EcoDiesel Ram 1500 pickups and Grand Cherokees. According to a statement released just this morning, in fact, FCA continues to deny any intentional cheating. Quote, the settlements do not change the company's position that it did not engage in any deliberate scheme to install defeat devices to cheat emissions tests. Further, the consent decree and settlement agreements contain no finding or admission with regard to any alleged violations of vehicle emissions rules. In other words, the EPA is making the claim that FCA knowingly and deliberately installed cheating devices on these vehicles to falsify emissions reports. FCA is saying that if a million monkeys types on typewriters long enough, that you'll eventually get Shakespeare. The old adage of if you look for something hard enough and long enough, you'll eventually find something that you can convince yourself is proof of what you were looking for to begin with. Now, I can't read code, let 100 million lines of it, and I'm sure that if we, I'm sure we'll never get to the know the absolute truth in all of this, but by the sounds of it, FCA is at least trying to make things right regardless, and we may just see a mass of real cheap eco diesels hitting the market here very soon. 
You know, uh, I got to say, I love the smell of diesel exhaust in the morning. <laughs> uh, and, and and I think you guys know this. I think a lot of people are computer savvy these days, and I like to think I am. Um, just because it has a lot of lines of code doesn't mean it's good code. Yeah, <laughs> it can be very sloppily written and have a lot of a lot of lines of code. Uh, so uh, don't don't be too impressed that your, your Jeep has more lines of code than uh, than a Boeing seven fifty seven. So 87. 87? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that's a big boy. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, anyway, so, and, and, and uh, keep in mind, it's a lot easier. The, the fewer things to hit, all you have to do is worry about hitting the planet whenever you're flying a jet. Well, you know, you compare this to like the Volkswagen uh, scandal, yeah. which really was kind of nasty. Oh, I mean, yeah. they got hit pretty hard. I mean, much harder than FCA is getting hit as far as, you know, the total dollar figures and stuff go. So uh, not to mention uh, Volkswagen had to do the whole vehicle buyback thing, uh, which FCA is not going to have to do. Uh, it looks like regulators are um, agreeing to the, you know, what FCA is trying to do as far as you know, apologize, uh, be, you know, come clear as what they're doing. I mean, they're they're not uh, they're not trying to fight this. They're just not really contesting it, other than saying that we didn't do it. And here, we're just going to make right by paying off these fines and just you know sweep it under the rug. I think is kind of how this is all being played out. Well, keep in it's mind, probably cheaper for them that yeah. way. Mm, keep yeah. in, keep in mind, you can't give Germans an inch now. The, and the Jeeps won the war, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you lose some and you win some. Speaking of world wars. Uh, the legal battle between Jeep and Mahindra is still waging on. Despite this, though, the Indian automaker is still planning on showing its vehicles at the Detroit Auto Show next week, even though they are not yet, nor may they ever be, for sale here in the States. As you may recall, Jeep parent company FCA had filed a trade complaint with the U.S. International Trade Commissions in 2018, arguing that the Mahindra Roxer infringes on Jeep trade dress, which is a trademark in image or appearance of a particular product. The concept of trade dress is considered to be just below the status of a patent, making enforcement a little difficult at times for established users of the trade dress code, which is also a factor here in this case. Now, if I've lost you at this point, think of it like this. You can't make your own syrup and then bring it to market packaged in something that looks exactly like the Aunt Jemima bottle. You know, copyright infringement and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Now, Jeep recently won a round in the ongoing dispute when the U.S. Uh, US International Trade Commission determined that the company is not contractually barred from enforcing its trade dress following a prior agreement with Mahindra years ago. Here's the details of all that, how that came to be. In 2009, Mahindra sought to bring the, to the U.S. another vehicle called the Scorpio, which was a mid-sized SUV at the time. The Scorpio in the Indian market had a seven-slot grille, which was vaguely reminiscent of one of that of the Grand Cherokee here in the States at the time. And the two automakers agreed on a different design for Mahindra's SUV, were it to introduce the Scorpio here in the States, that is. Specifically, the two companies agreed that if Mahindra used the agreed-upon grille design on the Scorpio, Chrysler would not pursue any intellectual property claims against the company. Well, all that goes out the window when you renege on the deal. And that's just what Mahindra has done. By insisting on keeping the seven-slot grill for the Roxer now and not using the agreed-upon design formally outlined in the previously legally binding documents the two automakers had agreed to, well, now, although Roxer is a different vehicle than the Scorpio, the intellectual property violations are still a valid concern. Despite all of this, Roxer is still coming to the Detroit Auto Show, but all of this litigation is making it very unclear as to whether or not the little off-road-only mini Jeep out of India will actually be sold on U.S. soil. Do you think they're going to get in a fight at the show? <laughs> <laughs> the Jeep guys and the... That, that's a good question. That's a good question. I'm, I'm sure that you know the show organizers are putting them at opposite ends of the you know <laughs> right. of, the, of the showroom or whatever. But yeah, that's, that's that would a be good. good one, that Tammy. would just be good for the show. Now, you know, you mentioned the syrup container, and that got me thinking. If I was I bet to it did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awful. Now, would this be a copyright or a dress infringement if we mm. if we took a, a an outline that's roughly shaped like Nicki Minaj and moved the place where the stirrup came out lower? Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, what's the next story, Josh? <laughs> uh, this is one I, want, I wanted to get this out to you guys because uh, this is kind of one of those here really quick type of stories. Um, if you want to win a Jeep, a brand new Jeep, pay attention. It's called I'm, Rock This Raffle. I'm sorry, raffle. what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm listening. It's called, 
<laughs> it's called Rock This Raffle. It's the Lord's Foundation Jeep and Mazda giveaway. The Lord's Foundation is giving you a chance to win a 2018 Jeep Wrangler or a 2018 Mazda Miata, if that's what you're God. into, in, in the what's called Rock This Raffle, Lord's Foundation Jeep Mazda giveaway. Tickets are just 50 bucks and can be purchased by calling one 877 405-6113 or by visiting lordsfoundation.com. The winners will be chosen in a live drawing March 20th during KATC's 5 p.m. newscast and note, you don't have to be present to win. Proceeds, of course, benefit the Lord's Foundation, which supports charitable health care services in Acadia, Louisiana. We'll, of course, have the link to get in on this show uh, in the show notes for this episode at jeeptalkshow.com. Now, this may go against the spirit of this giveaway, but uh, if somebody wins this and they pick the Mazda Miata, I think we ought to find them and beat the shit out of them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, come you on. You chose wrong. That was not the right. I'm sorry. That was you know the what? wrong to answer. And, th- and that would be my son. He would. He would. Well, we know where he lives, so that's good. I know. <laughs> I would be so angry. And he's disowned. <laughs> uh-huh, exactly. I'm going to court. <laughs> well, if you have a news tip or response to any one of our stories, be sure to let us know what you have to say by phone or by email. A number of ways you can do that. Just head over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and find out how to reach out to us. Coming up here a little bit later in the show, an interview with Shody, a young Jeeper who was involved in a very nasty wreck right before Christmas of 2018, totaling his Jeep. Very nasty story. You guys want to check this out. Oh, and hang in there because coming up in Tech Talk, we have, uh, we're have we getting into some tips and tricks when working on the electrical system of the Jeep. It's about damn time, Josh. You had so many I great know, electrical stuff way back when, years ago, and I'm glad you're, uh, you're bringing that back out. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. You know, we're always asking you to go check out the 4x4 Radio Network, and it's for good reason. There's a ton of great shows there to check out besides ours, and you can tell your friends about all of them, too. We've got something for everybody over at 4x4radionetwork.com. How about the On the Trail podcast? Oh, the On the uh, the Trail Chasers uh, podcast is there. Center Steer podcast, that's a lot of fun, too. Don't forget about Dan and the 4x4 podcast. Lots of great off-road shows, and it's all for free. It's all at 4x4radionetwork.com. That's 4x4radionetwork.com. We'll see you there. Shut up and listen. Shut up. up So shut up. You don't shut up. Shut up, Shane. Hey. (laughs) Shut up and listen. It's time for Wrangler Talk. It's time for G-Mama. So, Tony and Josh, we're going back to my top five series, and this is top five basic tips for when you're off-roading in your Jeep, or I guess this might work for any vehicle that that you take off-roading. And these are basic fundamentals to give you a good start. They're not the only tips out there for off-roading because there are so many, many tips, but these are a good base to start from. Number five. So this is one where you need to pay attention to very closely, and it's the low points on your Jeep. You want to know your clearance when you're driving out there on the trails. Now, on the Jeep Wranglers, I can't speak for the other Jeeps, but the Jeep Wrangler low points are your differentials and your shocks in the rear. Those are the lower control arm area. And I have gotten hung up on both of these, my front diff and the actually the passenger rear shock area. Um, Now, I added the lower control arm skids and I added beefier diff covers to help protect my Jeep. But what you're going to want to do is get under your Jeep and look for all those low points. Now, one thing when you're driving in your Jeep Wrangler and you can line up that driver's side that um, it's like a stopper. It's for your windshield um, on the front of your hood. That driver's side one, that's where your front diff is lined up when you're driving. And then the footman loop is about where your rear differential is. So when you're driving down that rocky path, you can kind of pick where those rocks are going to line up. And you're going to always want to put your, what do they say when you see a rock, put a wheel on it. So know your clearance. Number four. This one is very, very important. When you're new to off-roading, 
um, especially when you're new to off-roading, you're going to want to pick, pick a good spotter. A spotter is someone who stands outside of your Jeep and directs you through the trail over the obstacle. And when you come up on a, upon an obstacle and you're unsure, always, always, always ask for a spotter. And what you want to do when you pick a spotter, you want to pick someone that you can trust, you feel confident in, someone who has a lot of experience off-roading, and someone who probably, if it's a difficult trail, has a lot of experience on that trail. So pick a good spotter. Number three. So once you pick that spotter, you're going to want to listen to that spotter. Don't listen to anyone else yelling out instructions. And you may want to tell them to shut up because you're listening to the spotter. And when that spotter tells you to turn right or to stop, you do it. So even though you feel like maybe you shouldn't, you need to listen to that spotter because you know what? They can see everything around your Jeep that you can't see. Um, So again, listen to your spotter and only listen to one person because that's who you want to keep your main focus on. And that's the person that you've picked that you trusted. Number two. So this is something that I was told to do when I first started off-roading. And there's just so much stuff going on. And I kind of faded away from it. And I'm trying to get back into it and trying to get into the good habit of doing this. And it's two-footed driving. You're going to have one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. Now, you don't do this. Well, you shouldn't do this when you're out daily driving or on the interstate. But this two-footed driving is going to give you a lot more control while you're going over those obstacles, especially hill climbs, rock, going over rocks, coming down off of rocks. So two-footed driving, practice that when you're on the trails always. Number one. Okay. I have seen this so many times out on the trails. I even see it when I watch um, off-roading videos. When someone is new to off-roading and they're not used to the sounds and the movement of their Jeep, they may get stuck on a rock, a tree limb, or another obstacle, and they slam on the brakes and they seize up and they've got this death grip on their steering wheel. I know this because I've done this several times. (laughs) And they do this because they're afraid. They're afraid, oh my God, I just broke my Jeep. What am I going to do? And they're freaked out. What you need to do is calm down. You just stop, put your Jeep in park and get out of your Jeep and look, see what you've done. Most people just sit in their Jeep and wait for other people to help them off the obstacle or whatever situation they're in. You should always, always get out and look. This is going to give you a chance to really get to know your Jeep and to see what you're hung up on, where it is, and all that. Don't just sit in your Jeep and let the spotter guide you over that trail. You're going to want to see what you got hung up on. This way, the next time, you're going to have that experience, that knowledge of knowing what you're getting hung up on, and you can probably avoid it the next time. Now, these are some awesome tips to help you build a great foundation when you're off-roading, And I actually did a video um, on YouTube on this, sharing the exact same thing. Um, You can watch it again if you want. But I have had so many new Jeepers out there who watched this video and they were so thankful because there's so many videos out there of and on the forums and everything where all these new people can't get this information because if you try to ask about this information, People are saying, oh, you're, you know, they, they give you grief for not knowing. Well, you got to learn from somewhere. And I think if we share our basic knowledge with these people, um, it'll help them become better Jeepers. So those are my top five basic off-roading tips. Hey, Tammy, a lot of good stuff right there. And thanks for bringing up some of the basic tips for off-roading. I mean, it can go any number of ways. And, and a lot of people take for granted some of the basics when you've, you know, had a lot of seat time, you've been wheeling for a number of years and whatnot. And especially if you're you're kind of new to some things and you're you're kind of, you know, gaining experience and you're building your Jeep up and, and pretty soon you're you're tackling more and more, you know, 10 trails or black diamond trails, you know, stuff like that, that you hadn't really uh, tackled much, you know, in years prior and stuff. You know, good for you. That's awesome. I do want to say a couple of things in regards to a couple of things that Tammy had mentioned there. 
all good advice and it all works for you know a, a varying number of people and varying number of situations. But two-footed driving can get you into a precarious position. And here's why. If you are focused on on keeping both feet off of the floorboard and onto the pedals, uh, it, it enables you to get thrown around a lot more if you don't have an anchor point. And what I mean by an anchor point is a flat foot on the floorboard of your Jeep to stabilize your body. Uh, imagine uh, getting you know up on a rock a little bit faster than you wanted to, and uh, and it kind of shifts you over to the passenger side kind of hard. Your body weight shifts to that side, and all of a sudden now you're flooring your Jeep. Uh, and imagine what could happen if you floor your Jeep in four low going up a trail on an obstacle. Uh, things, bad things could happen. I'm not saying it will every time. I'm not saying that you are cap- incapable of you know maintaining good proper you know leg position and foot position and all of that. Uh, but you know, not everybody has big feet and can rest their heels on the floor and manipulate their pedals very easily. So that might be something that works for you. It might be something that doesn't work for you, but just be aware of it can bite you in the butt if you end up in a position where it starts throwing you around a little bit, if you get into a rocky uh, situation. Um, and the other situ- uh, one I, I wanted to address was getting out of your vehicle out on the trail. If you are in a very off camber situation and you decide to exit your vehicle, you may you have just changed the overall weight distribution of your vehicle and it could be that you are barely on a teetering position where all of a sudden getting out of your vehicle now changes that weight distribution and all of a sudden now your jeep is rolling over um, or you get out of your jeep and you can't get back in because the bottom of that door is 10 feet off the ground because you're you know on a rock and off camber and on the uphill side etc 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 always want to be aware of your surroundings and you can always get yourself into a situation that you weren't expecting. Happens all the time off-road, especially when things are wet or during the winter months or snow wheeling, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really just a good idea to kind of take a ass- assessment of where you are, where the Jeep is, its position, et cetera, and, and figure out, is it safe to exit the vehicle? And can I do this you know, safely and without losing control of the vehicle? Outside of that, you know, it have fun <laughs> really <laughs> climb out climb over climb under all that sort of stuff get out there and have some fun i i, I think i think all this is really good and it really points out tammy that you really need to have somebody videoing when you're doing this because it sounds like it would just be wonderful for youtube any of these things that happen that josh is, <laughs> josh is <Right>. referring to <laughs> you know what i find interesting is you know when i'm describing these things um, in my mind, I'm seeing these Jeeps on the trails doing this, and I'm imagining rocks that are maybe a foot off the yeah. ground. And Josh is describing, which those are, you know, a foot, two feet, maybe three feet rocks every once in a while. But, um, well, not even three feet, but right. anyway, so those that's my experience. And it's interesting, when, what Josh is describing are the Rubicon Trail type situations. And I haven't experienced those yet. So I, I just find it interesting that there's so much more for me to learn. Well, you know? and don't forget, too, that the, all you have, all you can go by is what your experience is. Right. And um, I, I guess the thing to do would be to keep in mind, uh, think bigger. So whenever you're uh, thinking about these things and you're going to give somebody advice here on the show, you go, you know, this is what I've done. And this is what, you know, I've done on one, two feet rocks. Now, if you're oh, uh, hanging off over a ravine, you might not want to get out. <laughs> but generally speaking, <laughs> if it's safe, you know, do the whole uh, disclaimer thing. Uh, if it's safe to do so, it, it's very helpful to see yeah. what, what what's what's going on with your Jeep. And I, I know that you've run across this before where you uh, scraped your uh, skids on things and you were quite sure you were tearing out the bottom of the Jeep. <laughs> but getting right. out and looking at it, you go, pfft. It's fine. It's no right problem. Now. That's what they're there right. for. Yeah. But if you didn't get out and look, how would you know? And I think people need to understand, too, that you know every one of us has a different level of experience. Absolutely. And you know, but we're all it, wheeling on different terrain too. You know, I've, I've yeah. got a lot of mountainous terrain out here. We've got a lot of rocks. We've got a very unique kind of clay out here and, and of course all the rain and, and, and snow and stuff. Tony doesn't ever see any snow wheeling oh, down where he's right. at Love and uh, he's probably got a lot more sand and and and, uh, and mud wheeling than I do up here in Oregon. And, and Tammy, well, you're in a whole different ball game altogether than both of us. Uh, right. You know, with, uh, with uh, some really world-class wheeling uh, resorts just right around the way from you. So um, having, you know, 
exposure to a number of different kinds of terrain gets you exposure to a number of different kinds of scenarios and, and wheeling right. techniques that can be applied to those types of terrain. That's why it's always important to go with somebody who's been absolutely out on these things for the first, you know, when you go out for the first time. And it's pretty damned amazing somebody put together a show that brought in uh, people from uh, different places uh, around the uh, country I know. What a, what with a different experiences. Producer, like, and then we could or... all jump in here and throw in our two cents worth. I, yeah. And I have I have nothing to say other than something uh, smartass. So <laughs> that'll show you. I mean, the only thing I can think of is uh, wheeling uh, through protesters, which would be great from the uh, Oregon <laughs> <laughs> standpoint. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, it would. <laughs> Speaking of smart asses, coming up <laughs> later in the show, we're going to hear from Nikki G. Uh, God love him. <laughs> hey, speaking of guys, we got to love. I got to give a shout out to Kevin Sams, who gave us one of our last Facebook recommendations of 2018. And it was a great one. Thanks again, Kevin, for reaching out to us. And we want you listening to be just like Kevin. Be sure the next time that you log into Facebook, stop by the Jeep Talk Show page and give us a recommendation. Thanks in advance. Over 100 of them now. Hey, Jeep Talk Show. This is the FMG for checking in. Uh, just calling to say uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, Josh is out, uh, getting back out on the trail, and it sounds like Tammy's never left, so good job there. Uh, Tony, actually, I had something I was thinking about. I know you were having an overheating problem. I was wondering if that had started happening once you once you put your winch on. Um, I know that, obviously, the kinetic is slightly different, but um, what, since I put my winch on, I've noticed that my Operating temp has creeped up, especially uh, when I'm when it's hot and I'm running on the highway. So uh, just kind of some food for thought, baby. Uh, and uh, my son Logan wanted to say something. I just want it. Thanks again, guys. Oh, we missed it. Oh, come on! <laughs> oh, <laughs> not no. again. So this guy's going to be sick of t- calling in twice every week. <laughs> So uh, the, uh, the the winch, I'm sure, is diverting some of the airflow through the radiator. And I, I, I feel pretty confident that if I remove the winch, uh, the air conditioning condenser, uh, the front bumper, and probably the headlights, it would work out really well. <laughs> but I'm not driving my Jeep without the winch. So I will say this uh, for all those. Uh, and I've had several people jump in there with, with ideas. Uh, I've been messing with the overheat uh, running on the highway in, for a long time. Yeah, and uh, what I have found is uh, it ha- really has to do with the, the Jeep being lifted up. And I think the airflow passing under the Jeep instead of through the, the very narrow nose. And uh, uh, it just has to do with the with the configuration of the Jeep, basically. So uh, it, it started happening right after I lifted it, which means it still had the factory air dam, factory grill, factory everything. There was no winch. So it's been, a, been occurring uh, after the four and a half inch lift and 32 inch tires. So, so what I've recommended to, for Tony to do is uh, kind of outfit his Jeep with one of those things. Uh, kind of like when your dog gets surgery and you got to put that collar oh, around his uh, neck. Yeah. So we're going to do something like that in front of Tony's Jeep. And uh, he'll get a lot better airflow through and, the radiator. And I could, I could put a mic in the right spot and I could listen to conversations two or three cars ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, <all> right. <laughs> Look at that Jeep, man. Jell Jeep should red, be red. Red radar dish coming at me real fast. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should paint it red, too. Yeah, that's a good idea. Hey, if you haven't heard, we've been uh, giving away stickers. All you have to do is send us a self-addressed stamped envelope, or S-A-S-E. To find out where you to send it, just head over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. You'll see how to contact us there. We'll respond with a mailing address and where to send your S-A-S-E. And for limited time, you can be a JTS ambassador. You get more stickers and JTS cards. Now you can leave a sticker or a card under the windshield wiper of that badass Jeep you always see at Walmart. Just write Ambassador on the envelope. From the wilds of Alaska to the searing heat of the Australian Outback, what will you find in the back of a discerning overlanding vehicle? Well, an LT Wright Knives Overland Machete, of course. These are handmade from 1075 high carbon steel and your choice of either black or natural micarta. Need something that will stand out in the woods? Opt for the orange G10. It will not blend in with your surroundings no matter where you wander. LT Wright Knives is a small company with a family feel. Located in Wint- Wintersville, Ohio, they have a passion for what they do. LT Wright Knives creates knives for bushcraft, everyday carry, 
hunting, cooking, and overlanding, so you've got a lot of options. Each knife is thoughtfully designed, built, and tested before it heads out the door. Although they look good enough for the display cabinet, these knives like to work. Put the knife through its paces and you know you're backed by a lifetime guarantee. So carve, slice, and chop to your heart's content. Carry your preferred LT Wright knives model with pride. You're helping to support an all-American company that will stand behind their product with a lifetime guarantee and the satisfaction of a job well done. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventure, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LT Wright knife. For more information, go online to ltwrightknives.com. That's LT, right with the W, knives.com. You know, it's been a, a long while since we uh, have had uh, LT Wright Knives as, a, 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 as an advertiser, and I haven't uh, checked out their knives recently. I did not know they had a machete. That's pretty damn cool. Yeah, I think the last time they were on, I don't know if they had the machete or if they were working on it. I, I don't remember it being on their website. Of course, I was looking at more like everyday carry type of knives from their mm-hmm. website. Yeah. I really wasn't focusing on the, the bushcraft type of stuff. So um, really cool. It sounds like they're, they're bringing out some new products. Really amazing stuff over there. Go check them out. Pretty sure you're going to find something you're going to like. Well, I'm going to check them out. I got to go see that machete. Hi, it's Gretchen from Route 16 Off Road. I listened to your latest episode and the um, talk about the automatic versus manual when it comes to off road. I've driven a manual transmission since I was about 15. Um, driven off road with a manual since about 2015. Um, what I can say from my personal experience, um, even with running stock gearing, as long as you're in four wheel low, you don't need to use the gas to release the clutch. I've never personally burnt a clutch driving off road, and the only way I can pers- I can see anyone burning up a clutch is if they are running in four high instead of four low. For low, you, you let the transfer case, the transmission, you, you let that do all the work. You don't need the gas at all unless um, you're trying to speed up, obviously. Um, but when it comes to crawling, clutch out, no gas, it'll crawl over anything. And then if you're in a uh, bind where you're trying to uh, navigate a more difficult obstacle, I personally let it stall before I use the gas because I would rather stall it and save my clutch than to uh, risk burning my clutch. Anyway, that is um, my input on that from my personal experience, and um, talk to you guys later. Well, Josh, I have no experience off-roading in a uh, with a standard transmission. That sounds mm. kind of nice. Uh, I, I'm really surprised it doesn't. Uh, it's 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 easier than what I thought it was. It, it is and it isn't. Again, it, it really comes down to terrain, also your gearing and tire size. Um, if you're on 35s and you're still running 355 gears, uh, it's not going to be as easy as you saying, especially if you're in, into anything that has, you know, uh, any kind of serious elevation change or, you know, serious obstacles. If you're doing basic trail riding, um, you're just getting into some basic trails, you're heading out into some mountain roads, that sort of stuff, you know, absolutely. All day long, a stick, first gear, second gear, just keep it in there, and you might have to tap the gas a couple few times here and there. It's really all it is to it. But you get into some more technical wheeling, uh, and you get into some you know, some big rocks, you into some some serious rock crawling. You're gonna end up working that clutch a lot more than you're than what she was talking about. Um, if you're geared really low, you got uh, maybe a doubler or uh, you know two transfer cases. You're stacked up something like that. Well, you got a really deep low crawl ratio, or maybe you have a 241 or transfer case where you've got like you know a 400 to one crawl ratio. Well, then of course, absolutely. Uh, you run in a Rubicon. Uh, then you're going to have that low crawl ratio. You're going to be able to do what she was talking about. You have an older Jeep, bigger tires. You haven't done your gears yet. Not a chance in hell. So, Tammy, you've been out uh, wheeling with uh, Route One Six and uh, Gretchen. Uh, what kind of trails did you did you guys uh, get on? Was, would you say that it was um, something that you'd be surprised to find out that you really wouldn't have to use the clutch much? Um, I did not wheel with Gretchen's group. They, um, I don't think, no, because I think I was the only female in my group. Okay. Um, I will say the. Tr- so I didn't see the trails they were on. They were the the easier trails, um, but compared to shots fired, no, um, they pr- I was peer pressured into to going on the trails I went on, um, and um, afterwards I 
I think Gretchen what I don't remember if that was Gretchen. Well, that's all right if you don't if you don't recall. No. That's fine. I just I, um, no, I, I don't no, know. No, I've I never wheeled with her, so I don't know if she's decided. I don't recall if she was the one who decided that she was like upset that she didn't go with my group. I think that was Gretchen. Correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, um, I. And I don't want to like upset any of the Carolina Trails off road people or Brian <laughs> do or anything. It, but, but anyway, I'm going to do it. Know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I will say the Daniel Trail was really difficult. The part, the the obstacle part, but the rest of the trails, I feel like weren't as difficult compared to some of the trails at Roush Creek. So with that said, I think driving a clutch in Uari. I don't think that would be a problem. I don't think you would, unless you were on the, the obstacle part of Daniel Trail, you might have to floor it in some parts. And some of those Jeepers were, you know, I'm um, having a rough time. But they were going up the more difficult parts of the trail than I did. You got tech questions? Ah, oh, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good. I just, I, it's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. Yahoo! Well, it's all about making good connections. Just like any other major system on a vehicle, wiring can make or break your build. If you do it right, the entire electrical system is something that virtually disappears in your rig, never to be seen or thought about again. On on the other hand, if you cut corners, rush it, or tackle something beyond your skill set, it's likely that you're going to have done it wrong and you'll be chasing things like gremlins, non-functioning gear, popped fuses, and yes, even fires. Some of the things wiring does is not easily understood to many people, which may be why there are so many jeepers out there who would rather get stabbed in the eye than mess with wiring. But the truth is, is that wiring really isn't all that scary once you get an understanding of a few basic principles. Now, I'm not going to begin a lesson on polarity, electron flow, circuit layouts, or, or start outlining the equations behind Ohm's law. So even if you don't take the time to learn this stuff, you can still be a competent wiring person by following a few basic rules. Now, I am a professionally trained electrician of, of sorts. I'm not licensed to wire your house, but I hold what is basically one step below a master's degree in mobile electronics. After doing this stuff for more than half my life, I can honestly say that if you spend some time with some crimpers under the hood, you're going to learn something just new just about every time that you do something electrical related. Whether it's tackling a small lighting project or if you're ready to do a full bumper-to-bumper rewire job, chances are you're going to pick up something new along the way. Despite being professionally trained and having multiple certifications, a lot of what I've learned has come from trial and error, along with good old-fashioned experience. And of course, nothing beats experience. So what I'm going to try and do here is, over the next couple few episodes, is really more about making you uh, making your wiring projects easier, cleaner, and more reliable. Some of the stuff may be basic or familiar to you, but I'm willing to bet that you're going to be able to pick up a trick or two to help make your own wiring projects go a little smoother. Most wiring problems are the result of a poor connection, whether it's within a plug, a connector, or a splice that was made who knows where or who knows when. And don't forget to check your grounds, Jeepers. Goodness gracious, that's like the Jeep electrical credo right there unto itself. If you're lucky, a bad connection will just break the flow of electricity and whatever it's feeding will just stop working. Worse are the bad connections that restrict electrical flow but don't stop it. Restrictions mean resistance and resistance equals heat. Enough heat equals fire, even on circuits that are protected by a fuse. If you understand nothing else about electricity, understand that a good connection, good connections in your system are critically important to a safe and reliable circuit. Okay, so to that end, let's get into how we make those connections when doing something like installing a stereo or hooking up a new set of lights in our Jeep. There are two schools of thought when it comes to electrical connections, soldering or crimping. Soldered connections offer excellent connectivity, so there's no resistance to the electrical flow. However, soldered connections can work harden, meaning they become brittle due to the heat used to solder, and break when subjected to extended periods of vibration. But the biggest thing that gets in the people's way is that, well, solder connections are a lot more labor-intensive. Soldering 10 connections will take you at least twice to three times as long or more than just basic crimping. This is why some wiring guys stay away from soldering altogether. Crimp connections offer mechanically locking wires together inside of a metal barrel. A properly crimped connection is more or less impervious to vibration, but can offer less conductivity in some cases. Therefore, a crimped connection introduces more opportunity for resistance and voltage drops in sensitive circuits. So why not have the best of both worlds, you might ask? Uh, Well, this is going way over the top and obviously is going to be the most labor-intensive or time-consuming electrical connection type. 
Start, starting with an uninsulated terminal or a butt connector, which doesn't have any nylon around it. These are available online or at most hardware stores, but not as often at auto parts stores. You're going to strip and crimp the wires like you normally would and then apply solder to both ends of the barrel. Slide some adhesive line shrink tubing over the connection and apply shrink to it, heat, apply heat to shrink it. Well, this method supplies strength of a crimp connection with the superior conductivity of a solder connection and with the right shrink wrap can be made 100% weatherproof too. So if you're wiring something with multiple connections in the same area, such as like a pigtail uh, for like a relay or a headlight circuit, whenever possible, you're going to want to stagger those connections. What I mean by that is, you know, don't put them all in one area. If you put all the connections in the same place, cut all those wires at the same length, and all those connectors are all going at the same place, more or less, you end up with a big, unsightly bulge in the harness, and there's a lot greater likelihood for shorts and, well, wires coming out, things like that. Staggering the connections makes it a lot easier to wrap up the harness, and it just looks better in the, in the long run. It's a pretty safe bet that a 4x4 is going to see mud and water at some point in its life, and an open rig like a Wrangler can count on seeing lots of mud and water everywhere. Water is bad for wiring for many reasons. Go figure, right? So it's really a good idea to use weatherproof connections whenever possible. GM weather pack connectors are a great choice and can be found in a variety of different configurations, and shrink tubing is available with adhesive inside that flows out to the wire insulation when it's heated, sealing the connection from the elements. When in doubt, it's hard to go wrong with anything marine grade. Marine grade and weatherproof stuff is going to be a bit more expensive for your Jeep, but it's going to be worth it in the long run. Next week, we're going to go a little bit deeper into wiring, and I'll start outlining the tools that you want to consider adding to your Jeep's kit, as well as more wiring basics, and I may even touch on some larger project considerations for those of you out there tackling a winter restoration project. Looks lots more tips and tricks in the weeks ahead, so stay tuned. Uh, Josh, I think we we spoke about this like in chat or something, or maybe I shared a, a, an image or a video with you. Uh, I saw something. Uh, it's available to Amazon. I'm sure you can get it other places, but it's called a heat shrink solder sleeve crimpless butt connector. Say that three times fast. I was going to say, easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look it up, but basically, uh, it's uh, this little thing that looks like a uh, it looks like a crimp connector, except it has the heat shrink tubing that's clear. And there's a there's a little cylinder of solder in the middle, and you take wow. the, take the two wires and you put it uh, underneath the you know you cross them over where the solder is, and then when you're heating up the whole contraption, it, it shrinks the tubing and melts the solder because the solder has a, a lower uh, heat point I believe, mm -hmm. and solders the two uh, ends together and heat shrinks it all at the same time, and believe it or not, they only cost fifty nine cents a piece. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> but it's a brilliant idea i mean if you look at some of the videos and stuff it, it really is nice and it gets rid of that uh the it, the speed problem whenever you go to solder uh the connections when i was doing a uh, low voltage uh, commercial and residential alarm installations uh there was uh these little things that we called beanies um when i when i was in the industry now this is many many years ago i'm sure that they either don't use them anymore or maybe they have a, a different name for them or but it was basically um a one-way butt connector that was filled with uh some sort of a silicone oh it's got that goo uh, in it yes yes and i loved those things uh, I, they didn't make for a clean wiring job for like harnesses and stuff but if you were making a c connections behind panels or behind a place that, that got closed up or that you'd never, ever see again, you know, someplace behind the dash or something like that, uh, th they were an excellent alternative to just standard butt connectors. But again, they were kind of expensive. The, uh, the phone company always used those when they were doing installs because, you know, their wiring was outside, the connection was outside, mm -hmm. and, that, and that gel that was in there uh, kept the, uh, the wires from, uh, you know, getting moisture in. Absolutely. So, Josh, I got two quick questions for you. By all means. Um, why is it that in automobile wiring... Black is negative, but in house wiring, that's the the positive. <laughs> well, the difference between DC and AC, I guess. Uh, you know, it's uh, two two different kinds of uh, of electricity there. And the other question is, um, whenever you're doing wiring on your vehicle, and you're using tape, do you have to use the brand name Scotch tape, or can it be any clear uh, cellophane uh, sticky thing to to make your connections? Right this way, Tony. This is going to hurt. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, don't ever use scotch tape or masking tape or even duct tape for your wiring. That is a big no-no, people. Uh, never, ever, ever use those. Just use le- electrical tape if you have to. If you have to use tape, uh, I, I, I really the only time that you should use tape is either in an emergency or to kind of uh, hold some wires out of the way or to make yourself a, a very cheap and, and uh, not very long lasting electrical loom. Um, but otherwise, it, twisting and taping your electrical connections uh, is just going to lead to very bad things happening later down the road. And if you've listened to this show very long, anytime we talk about el- electrical stuff and uh, vehicles, I always give Josh a hard time about cellophane tape because I know it gets under his skin. <laughs> I've seen it. I had so yeah, many uh-huh. backyard installs that it's like, well, I that's can't why you even drove this thing in here without it bit catching on fire. Well, that's know? why it bothers you because <laughs> you have a flashback. It's like being back in Vietnam. Oh my God. Oh, there's, there's, just, there's these websites or whatever, like, you know, uh, look what rolled into the shop today.com or something like that. And, and it's these, you know, these mechanics and, and technicians and, and stuff who, who have these, these, these people bring in these vehicles. <laughs> and and something has been done to them, or it's like, well, I didn't know that you were supposed to change the oil, you know. And it's like, oh, you mean when the wheel is red hot and smoking, you're supposed to do something about that, you know? And it's like uh, these amazing, amazing. I don't even know. It, Darwinism doesn't even begin to describe the stupidity that you see on some of these websites. But I, I just love seeing that stuff because it, it takes me back to the day when I was uh, in the industry and and seeing all that and dealing with it and. A little nostalgia. Well, you know, you so what about? Uh, um, I used tape when I did my off road life. Come here, Tammy. Come here, Tammy. But, but wait, 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 <laughs> wait. I used I used liquid tape. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. I, no. I, no. I, I did. I didn't just use liquid tape. I soldered it. Then I did oh. the shrink tube, and then I used liquid tape. Wow. Okay. So Tammy went above and beyond there. I thought you were saying you just twisted and, no, and, just, no, like, no. and I was like, oh, okay. I don't like the, the liquid electrical tape only because going back in and doing rework uh, is extremely messy having to deal with that stuff, especially in summer months. If, if right. it's been around for a few years and that stuff has been around and, and soaked up moisture and and it's gotten hot and cold a few dozen million times. And yeah, yeah you start having to peel that stuff back and, and work through it. And it is an absolute mess. Yeah. It works. It's really cool stuff. If you never, ever have to w- worry about that, that electrical, whatever you just did ever again. Which right now, knock on wood, I haven't. Well, anything to add yourself. Maybe you have a question for Tech Talk. Just jump over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and send us a message. The Jeep Talk Show. It's not about us. It's about you, the listeners. It's Tim from Torrance. Hey, Jeepers. This is uh, Rob from Antonio, Texas. Hey, guys. It's Cody with TrailChasers.net with another grand adventure. Hey, guys. This is Cody from Indiana. Yoo-hoo. Hello, Jeep Talk Show crew. This is FJ Rick. Hi, guys. This is Joe. If a turtle doesn't have a shell, is he naked or homeless? Hey, guys. This is Ron out in Arizona. Hey, what's up? The Jeep Talk Show. This is Jason, Oregon Trail Off-Road. Hi, this is Jake from California, and I'm sitting here eating pork rinds for breakfast. Hey, this is uh, PA Jeep Freak. Hey, Tony, Josh, Danny, it's like today, Jake calling. This is John, Free Runner in 1982, and on today's Radio Contact segment, I'm going to talk about APRS, an anal probe restraint system. No! No, 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 that's not right. We love our listeners. From around the world. Or from your city. And sometimes just down the street. Howdy, neighbor. It's the Jeep Talk Show interview. So, Shodi, welcome to the Jeep Talk Show podcast. Can you, first of all, tell us how you got into Jeeping? Or how you got into be, being a Jeep owner? I got into being a Jeep owner mostly because of the influence around me. My parents got a Jeep, they really liked it, and a lot of my friends had Jeeps, so I figured I'd give it a try, see what all the talk's about. And they had their Jeep for four years, and we'd always take it on the beach and just put the top down and enjoy the cruise. So I decided I'll go ahead and get one too, just so I could fit in a little more and well, there you go. I have one, and it's 
it feels so much better than driving a normal car because you have that comfort of, you know, you have something that's good off-road. So if anything happens, good in the snow. And it's just a style that I've liked. So your parents have Wranglers. Yes, they have two Wranglers. And what kind of Jeep did you get? I got a Cherokee. Why did you, like, veer off into the Cherokee land? Why did you not pick a Wrangler? Um, I like the Wranglers. I just think that everybody has a Wrangler. So I wanted to stand out, be a little different. That's why I went with the Cherokee, because they're pretty much the same platform. The only difference is that the Wranglers are full frame, and the Cherokees are unibody, and that's pretty much it. And I just like the little more of, like, a enclosed boxy feel. So you're, what, 20 years old? 20, yep, just turned 20. 20. And when you graduated from high school, you went straight working for an auto body, or an auto mechanics, right? I worked for, I want to say a year and a half while I was at the end of my high school, yes. Why did you pick, you know, auto mechanics? I've always wanted to work on cars, and I've always liked cars, and the idea of them ever since I could walk and talk. Uh-huh. Um, so you work at this shop, you know about cars, mm -hmm. you started doing your own modifications on yep. your Jeep? I was going to put a lift kit on my old Jeep Cherokee, as, because I wanted to lift it and make it look a little better, and I wanted to do it myself because I know I have the knowledge to do it myself, and it's just, it feels better when you work on your own car. Yep. So, something prevented you from doing that, can you tell us about... Do you feel comfortable talking about the Yeah, accident? that's fine. Okay. okay, so on December 23rd, I was heading up Route 15, and there was very little traffic, and a there's crossroads on Route 15, and a guy in a pickup truck was on the left side. I was in the right lane. He decided to pull out in front of me, which is somewhat understandable, but the fact that he pulled out into the right lane instead of the left lane... So I tried to miss him by swerving into the shoulder, and then he also had the same idea. He came into the shoulder, he hit me on the shoulder, and this was all at highway speeds, and my Jeep got pushed into an embankment. The Jeep dug into the embankment, and that's what caused it to roll over. Now, did you roll from side to side, or it kind of looks in the pictures like you flipped? It looks from the front end on end. end. Yeah. And, and I, just, I can't exactly remember how many times, uh -huh. but just by looking at it, I want to say two. So do you remember flipping? I remember the moment from when he pulled out to when it was all over. It, my body was still in shock at the time, so I can't remember 100% everything, but I remember feeling the impact, and I wasn't expecting to roll over. I just felt the impact, and all of a sudden, there was glass and mud being thrown around into me. Were you, like, scared? Did you think you were going to die? I was very scared. I had no clue. I had very little control, and my brain was just thinking of what exactly is going to happen because of all this. And uh -huh. I, I was scared that, yeah, I could have been seriously injured. So you rolled, and you flipped, and you flipped, and you flipped. Then what happened? You're in the Jeep. Are you upside down? The Jeep is upside down, and I crawled out of it. And when I crawled out of it, I tried to stand up because the adrenaline's going. You want to get away from it quickly. Because I don't know what my surroundings were. So I tried standing up and I couldn't. Fell up on the side of it. And the witnesses who were driving by decided to pick me up and set me up against one of the signs that uh -huh. it just missed when it rolled over. So what was going through your mind then? Um, how am I going to get home is pretty much what was going on in my head. <laughs> did, did you look at your Jeep and were you upset? I looked at it and... I have to admit, I did cry when I was watching it, because the horn had a distinct tone to it uh -huh. when it was going off, like an alarm, but it was like subtle. It was like it was crying for me. Aww. So your Jeep alarm system or the horn was stuck, and it was yep. the whole time? The whole time. Oh. So your injuries, what happened? My injuries are I hit my head, I sprained my neck, I have abrasions on my shoulders and down the left side of my back. I have a bruise and an abrasion on my hip, my knees, and my ankles. But my left ankle is the worst because it, we think it has a tear in one of the ligaments. So, 
Are you able to go back to work right now? No, I have a doctor's notice for another two weeks uh -huh. because we don't know how quickly the ankle will heal up. And my work is heavy duty. Right. So what's next? Are you going to buy a new Jeep? Are you... Obviously your Jeep that you have in the, from the accident is totaled. It's completely totaled. Yep, the roof's all smashed in. Um, yes, I actually bought a new Cherokee. It's one year newer than my old one. It's a 2000, which is the last year they made them. I bought it on Friday. And it's this one is four and a half inch lifted on a set of 31s. So it has all the work I wanted done to it, which makes me happy. But now I have to figure out what I want to do with my other lift kit for the other one I was going to put on. You'd buy another Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I don't think your parents approve of that, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So, are you going to take your Jeep off-roading? Is it just a daily driver? Or maybe we should ask this question later when, <laughs> when um, someone's not listening. <laughs> it makes sense not to take it off-road because of how well-conditioned it is. You don't uh -huh. want to start messing things up on it. And it's more of like a point A to point B. And the reason I got mine and kept mine clean was because I wanted it to be more for show. Right. So, you will you could go to the... The Jeep show up in Pennsylvania and show it off. Yep. Go to those show and shines. Yep. Keep it clean and let people look at it, see what they think. And it's for how old it is, it has a very small amount of rust. I mean, there's almost no visual rust on it whatsoever. Wow. My Jeep's already rusting. And it's a lot newer than yours. It is. So, what did you think about the GoFundMe page and complete strangers that you didn't know donating? What, how does that make you feel? I feel like, even though I never really met the people, I feel like they have a part in the community and they wanted to make sure that they did their part by helping around. Even though you don't know the person doesn't mean that you don't know what's going on. You have things that go on in your lives too that make you feel kind of down and you want somebody to help. It's one of those things where even though you don't know the person, the fact that they went above in their day to go ahead and help somebody. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things where they know it happens. They know that they just want the pain to go away. So did you know what you were getting into when you bought a Jeep about this whole Jeep community? Did you really realize? Not a hundred percent. Um I didn't Jeep has definitely had a big influence on people and one of those things to me I'm starting to realize what people actually see in them. I figured it was just a car towards the beginning of my experience with mm -hmm. it. But then I actually got into, okay, now I know what it's about. It's, I don't want to say it's necessarily showing off, but it kind of is. It's right. more like I have right. something that looks good and will do good no matter what. So do, do, do any Wranglers wave at you? Have you do you get wrang, waves from Wranglers? The Jeep wave is more common with the Wranglers, but I will get people who will look at mine and they uh -huh. tell me that it's nice and they will actually wave and uh -huh. if there's somebody that pulls up next to me they will roll their window down and say hey you have a nice jeep yeah isn't that a good feeling it is especially when you're in the drive through and everybody in the back is looking at your jeep and because they probably think it looks really good and they probably want it right exactly anything else you want to share um extent of my injuries is pretty slight now uh -huh. for how severe the crash was. I'm in a, I want to say ankle support, and I go to physical therapy right. for another month just to see how I can just relax and get everything back to where it needs to be. Right. So do you have nightmares about the accident at all? I, for or the first you... week, have had a hard time sleeping because that's all I could think about uh -huh. was the accident, all the time and money I put into it. And we were stressed, you know, insurance companies don't like to take sides. They don't like to give you money. And right. We were just stressed that I was going to lose out on it. Did and you? I had just put a new engine in it, so it's, I didn't want to lose out on that either. Right. Did you get any money from the insurance company? Or are you still working with them? They take 100% responsibility. <clears throat> the other driver's insurance, so. Oh. So, I want to say yes. We found that out on Friday. Oh, that's good. So you get to recruit some of it. So, yeah. So the money that we we just bought that. So we'll see if they give us enough to make up for how much that is. Right. And my other question is, were you able to 
salvage anything from your old Jeep? I know people who get in Jeep accidents, they take off their track bars, they're able to get their fenders or... My whole entire front end was destroyed. I mean, we don't think the engine itself is in. We think a lot of connectors got smashed. Maybe the front end where the thermostat is. We know there's no more fan on it. There's dents all over the body. The only thing that's really salvageable on it is just a couple things that didn't fly out in the accident, like my tow rope and my mm -hmm. tool bag, and that's pretty much it. And one of the floor mats, that's it. Oh. One of the Jeep mats we were able to salvage right. because the floorboard on the driver's side came up onto my ankles, and it's like a rollover for the floorboard so we can't get underneath to get the floor mat from the driver's side. Maybe you could salvage a, a door handle or something, right? <laughs> something, but it's really not much. Right. It's, it's I want to say, a full loss. But there's always a silver lining, right? There is. There's always, there's always a car. You can't replace a person, but you can't replace a car. Right. That's what I did. So Tony's big question, I'm sure, is what color, because Tony has a Cherokee, too, mm -hmm. and he likes red Jeeps. He has a, they have a red TJ. So what color is your Jeep? My old Cherokee was green. Uh-huh. Um... It was, the more popular for those was the darker green. Mm -hmm. This was more of like a lighter green. My new one is silver. Which is more towards a black color than a red color, right? Yes. Okay. It's, I always liked the silver. And when I went first to even go look at my first Cherokee, I was looking at either getting a black one or a silver one. So the silver Smart one's man. more of like, <laughs> I just feel like the silver looks a lot better on them. Right. The red's good. And the other colors are good. I just feel like the black and the silver is what makes them stand out a little more. Good answer. But the other question is, what color is one of your parents' Wranglers? Red. Red TJ. Boo. <laughs> Chody, thanks for chatting with us. No problem. And um, good luck. And keep us posted on your modifications that you make on your Jeep. I will. I'll let you know. Thank you. No problem. Oh, man. Thanks again, Shoddy, for taking the time to relive that horrible accident with us and talk about the wreck that totaled your beloved first Jeep. Man, such a sad story. Hey, but do you have an idea for a guest? Do you yourself work in the off-road industry or know somebody who does? Maybe you would like to be a guest on the Jeep Talk Show. Everybody has a Jeep story. We want to hear yours in 2019. Reach out to us right now. Go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact right now and share your idea for our next great guest. Who knows? We might very well have you on the Jeep Talk Show very soon. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And the one good thing about having 367-ish episodes is you can listen to one a day for a year. And in that year, you'll hear 12 whale songs, seven conversations between me and Sir Craps a lot, and it'll be a whole year before you figure out that I recycled a joke. That's not why I'm calling. I'm a little concerned about my next-door neighbor. He works on a road construction crew. I think he's stealing from his job. I didn't want to believe it, but when I got home today, all the signs were there. All right, boys and girls, I'll catch you later. You have a good one. You are Goodbye. talking about the nonsense and ravings of a lunatic mind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> love me some Nikki g i was uh, like every now and again catches me off guard and oh yeah, yeah. i was like i remember that joke <laughs> I thought it was, that was a good joke though i thought it was pretty funny <laughs> okay class it's time for a review let's check it out check it out it's time for jeep mama's product review yeah what is it and why do i want it so I'm going to talk about the More Ride Jeep Ammo Can Carrier with the Molly Panel. And I bought this, gosh, back in uh, August of 2017, I believe it was, um, during um, a long, long trial and error basis of trying out different storage units in the back of my, my Jeep. Um, Jeep Wrangler owners know that that's one of the most difficult things to figure out what works for you in the back of your Jeep because um, cargo space is at a premium in the Wranglers and especially even in the JKUs, the four doors. Um, and I, like I said, I tried so many different options and 
that space sometimes can be pretty awkward. For example, the space above the inner fenders in the cargo area of, of the Unlimited, and the Unlimited is the four-door. And it's a curved, slope, irregularly shaped area that's just so wasted. But the more ride ammo can carrier, um, they designed that to use the space very effectively. And it's a super easy um, piece of, of steel that you bolt in place using the same holes that you secure the hard top with. And there's no drilling. The carrier supports all the common ammo size cans. Uh, but I've opted out of the cans and I'm using um, canvas tool bags instead that work just as good. And on the front of the grid, um, it's like a shelf over the, the wheel, the tire. And then right along the side of it inside your Jeep is a Molly grid. And it's used for attaching, you know, the Molly, the Molly standard pouches um, or other gear. It's very rugged and waterproof. Um, the common uses for the ammo can that you carry stuff in your Jeep, like your recovery supplies, um, maybe some small oil, um, liquids, that type of thing, tools, any other gear you need it. Um, the grid attachment of the Molly standard pouches and other gear, like I said, easy two bolt installation using the holes already in the Jeep. And it can be installed on either side of the Jeep or both, which I have. It's 16 gauge steel, um, durable powder coat finish, and it fits the 07 to the current Wranglers. I don't know about the JL. I We need to check that out. And it comes with the ammo can shelf, but not the ammo can, a little ratchet strap to hold the ammo can in, all the hardware, except for the two bolts, because you're going to be using um, the ones that are already in the Jeep. Um, if you have a hard top. If you don't like mine, I had a soft top, so I had to go buy some 5 16 bolts. And um, they're pretty much the same bolts that you use your diff cover with. And it comes with instructions. I love this because it's like a three in one storage unit because there's the shelf for the ammo can, there's the Molly bag panel, and in between the Molly bag panel and the carpeted area where your tire is, you can shove stuff in there. Like I can fit a recovery strap in there or my tree saver or a raincoat or, you know, whatever. You can just shove it in there and it's actually, it's secure in there. So Molly or the More Ride Jeep Ammo Can Carrier with Molly Panel and you can go over to More Ride, M-O-R-R-Y-D-E.com to check it out. I give this five stars. I like the idea of uh, using the ammo cans for uh, for storage. It's uh, it just has a cool factor to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Which, by the way, I have the two ammo cans that I got. I painted them purple, but I just didn't like the clanky noise. So, if anybody needs any ammo cans, I know Nate was looking for some. Give me a call. You didn't think about uh, getting some rubber and making some isolators so you could get rid of the clanky noise. Oh, I've got um, like a bag of these rubber feet. I mean, they're just like the like little little tiny rubber feet that you'd put on a on the bottom of a small appliance or something like that. I'll mail you a bag of them. I'm not sure if it's like the handle part on the top or if it's I don't know why it clanks. I I would have to sit back there while I'm driving, and that oh, really I think you could work. Too I think well. you could just hold it in your hand and figure out uh, where it's rattling mm -hmm. really quick. Oh. But anyway, you've moved on from that. I was just, I remember when you, uh, you got those things and I thought, that's, that's really cool. It's a great idea. And then I, you know, you didn't like it because it was noisy and I went, eh, I think I would have, uh, I think I would have gone a different direction, but, uh, that's a nice thing about uh, your Jeep. You can do what you want to with it. Right. And I love the canvas bags cause I actually, you can, it, it, it's more form fitting and you can put more stuff in them in the canvas bags because you know, it's flexible. Where'd you get those cam uh, canvas bags from, Tammy? Oh, they were just Craftsman, the red and black canvas tool oh. bags. Okay. So, do you have an idea for a product review? Just visit our contact page and let us know what you'd like to hear on our next product review. And coming up in a few minutes, we're going to hear a little bit about some events that are happening in your hometown and around the nation in Wheeling Wear. Jeep's kind of noisy. I might have an exhaust problem. Mm, I don't anymore. <laughs> so years ago, uh, 
I don't know when or why or how or any of that stuff, but uh, on my 99 Cherokee, the exa- central exhaust hanger, uh, the bar that is essentially welded uh, to the, the pipe in front of the catalytic converter, it basically comes off of, uh, it's just a bar. It's a bent bar that comes off of that and goes into the rubber mount that is uh, essentially attached to a plate that sandwiches between the cross member and the transmission. So it was, uh, or, or the transfer case, transmission transfer case. Anyways, um, that bar broke. I had tried to, you know, fab up something uh, really shoddy. That didn't work out too well. Um, it, uh, I got rid of it very quickly. Um, so for a while, the the exhaust has just sort of been resting on the um, on the cross member there. Well, I don't like that. It, it it vibrates. It's got a weird note to it. And, and I was just like, I've, I've got to take care of this, especially with a, a little bit of an upcoming wheeling trip that I've got going on. So um, a local place that I swear by that I've been taking vehicles to, I've recommended people for years and years and years. They've got a few shops around the uh, Portland metro area uh, here out where, where I live. Um, they're by, by the name of Ed's Muffler. They've been around for a long, long time. Um, and a little, you know, uh, little hometown chain type of thing. Uh, they do excellent work and they work with you. Well, I've been taking my Jeep there for years and years and years. Uh, they've, uh, when I wanted to get rid of the, the factory downpipe with a restrictor, um, I went in there and I was like, you know, this is going to be completely custom. I- I'm sure that you guys have never done this before. Uh, and they hadn't, uh, but they knew exactly what I was talking about. And they fabbed up something for me, had me in and out in less than an hour. Uh, and I've never had to worry about that ever again. So a uh, big shout out to Ed's Muffler out here in, uh, in the Portland metro area. Uh, guys do great work, and I always recommend uh, sending people to them. Um, last weekend's impromptu light wheeling trip was an absolute necessity. After uh, the last week that I had gone through, I, I, I thought I knew what pain was, uh, but uh, apparently I didn't. Uh, Thursday night was one of the worst nights of my life. And uh, after dealing with that in the weekend, um, I, I needed to get out. I needed to get out into the woods. I needed to, to get out to my church, more or less get out and be one with mother nature and all that and get out into some mud, get the Jeep dirty. And that's just what I did. I uh, went out Sunday out in the Mount Hood National Forest, um, out into the Lottie Flats OHV area. I haven't been up there since the uh, major redesign a couple few years ago. Uh, and uh, it's only been open for, for a couple few years now. Um, and uh, some amazing trail systems that they have up there. Uh, I only uh, hit up maybe, I think we were on two trails altogether, uh, but there were at least four four or six others that I saw just in the areas that we were at that I definitely want to go back and go check out. Um, Through that trip, I discovered that, um, well, it was uh, kind of a little bit of a shakedown run as well uh, because, uh, well, I I, I didn't have four low the entire time. Um, Get out there and I go into four low and it just, it's bottoming out in the gate and it will not engage into four low. And it was raining. It was muddy. I was like, screw it. I'm not going to get anything super technical. Um, we're just out here to kind of putz around a little bit. Uh, and that's more or less what we did. And I did it all in four high the whole day. Um, it was fine because again, we didn't get into any any serious rocks or any, you know, technical crawling or anything like that. Um, but it was was mostly just trail riding. Uh, so I was able to do it in four high without any, without too much difficulty. But I tell you what, there were several times where there were some rocky outcroppings where the trail would kind of go off to one side and you can kind of bypass this or whatever. And I had to bypass one obstacle after another because I just didn't have the torque and the low range to have the control that I wanted to to try and you know battle an obstacle. So uh, it was nice to get out there and get the Jeep dirty nonetheless, get out in some fresh air and some woods and some rain, uh, but nonetheless uh, have, have some issues that I need to deal with. Now, I don't know if you, if you want to mention this or talk about this or not, Josh. I, don't, I know you might, might hmm. want to jinx it, but you had mentioned that you may be uh, running across a Dana 44 here in the future. Is that possibly going to lead to a, a re-gearing? It, it would likely, because I don't know if I'm going to get the, the Dana 44 with gears or, or without. I'm, I'm, I'm even questioning whether or not I'm going to get it with axle shafts at this point. Um, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a buddy of mine. He's, he's got like three Jeep projects going on all at <laughs> once right now. God and bless and the, the poor SOB. No, seriously, though. Uh, it really, uh, before SOB, he's constantly changing his mind. And, and so he's, he's doing an XJ build, he's doing a Jeepster build, and he's doing a Wagoneer build all at the same time. And so he keeps going back and forth with one thing. Well, he finds these deals and it's, it's like, well, I got this Dana 44 for a song and a dance. I couldn't pass it up. I, I had to get it. 
you know, I got this eight inch over here that I just, I've been sitting on for years and years and years and I've got, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And, you know, he's, he's got all this stuff and these axles. I'm like, well, you know, if you need to find a home for that 4040, you know, just let me know. <laughs> I'll be happy to give it a new home. And he's like, oh, sure. Yeah. You know, it's yours if you want it. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, I was like, well, I was just kidding, but okay. You know, so, um, it's it's on the radar. It's on the radar. A, a re-gearing has also been on the radar for quite some time. Oh, I yeah. do not have the gearing that I desperately need uh, for the type of wheeling that I do. So um, it, it, that is that is on the short list. But so is a potential axle swap. So ugh. well, I yeah, was kind of thinking do? that if you're if you're swapping out the axle, that is pretty much the time to you know that you're going to do the the re-gearing because it just just makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're not going to put a Dana 44 in there with a 355 uh, gear. <laughs> in it. No, no, absolutely not. So that's, uh, there's a lot of things that I've got to figure out with that because also at the same time, I would be doing a long arm kit, but I've got a long arm kit for a Dana 30, not a Dana 44. So uh, uh, some things would have to get sold. Some things would have to get uh, tied up and, and fabricated. I, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that's juggling right now, and likely nothing's going to happen this year. Right. Likely. Yeah. Well, so especially just, with the surgery that you just had. I mean, that's, that sets you back financially. Oh, good news on that, by the way. So I, I went in, and um, so long story short, uh, the reason why I was on the show last week, um, uh, an issue that had cropped up about almost a year ago to the day um, came back, and um, it, 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 a bone infection in my upper jawbone. And um, it's it's not dental related, but a, a dentist is about an oral surgeon is, is essentially the only person who can take care of it. Um, called in the last oral surgeon that I went into for this problem that I, I already knew exactly what was going on as soon as the symptoms started to happen. Started getting this pressure and and uh, and stuff in my cheek, and I'm like, oh, I know what that is. Next day I woke up and I was in pain, and I was like, yep, that's what it is. Called up, started getting uh, some antibiotics going immediately, and it, it took 24 to 36 hours for those to set in. But in that time, the infection also set in, and it was affecting my equilibrium, uh, my occipital lobe, uh, my uh, my sinuses, uh, my my vision, everything. And I spent all of Thursday night in a crumpled heap of pain, and it was no fun at all. Um, went in... Um, for, for oral surgery on Monday and they did a whole bunch of imaging and, um, and he determined, well, here's what we can do. We've got a few different options. What we can, you can and what we ended up doing is, is basically playing the wait and see game at this point. Um, there, there's a question as to whether or not the C word is in play. And, um, so there was a biopsy that was taken. There's some labs that are, that are being done and, uh, we'll find out news about that here in a, in a couple weeks or so. But, um, uh, he's he's concerned about a couple things, but there's a couple of other things that that he saw that has him a little more optimistic um, uh, optimistic about the, the outcome of all this. So uh, we'll know more here in the next couple of weeks. Did you find out if it's unusual for something like this to to reoccur? I was really surprised that it happened to start with, much less a year later. Because of the tissue, the location, and you know everything else that is that is going around. I mean, your, your sinuses, your mouth. I mean, just giant. Uh, collections of bacteria and, and stuff. Mm. And so it, it doesn't take much for something to set in. So he, when I asked why, he said, well, there's, there's, there's one of three things that are happening. Uh, one, it's a dental issue, which he more or less ruled out. Two, you could have, um, have had a low-lying uh, type of sinus infection or something like that that just sat there and you didn't know about it. Oh. And, and it. And it moved its way into the soft tissue um, above the jawbone and eventually transferred into the bone, and that's when you started to feel it. The other potential is the C word, and that's why biopsies right. and labs and stuff are all being done. Well, it's not that. I can tell you right now, that's not it's, that's not what it's going to be. Anyway, lots of uh, lots of luck there, and uh, I just hate the idea of the it, coming back. I would have uh, demanded some warranty work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> can I just get the new model, please? That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. So, well, Tammy, guys, what's going on? Uh, you got a, you got some wheeling trips coming up here in your near future, uh, don't you? Yes, I do. I'm going to Crawling for Cops. Um, in case anyone else wants to go out to that, that's um, the week May 31st is a Friday, and this is your that second Saturday. year, right? Third. This would be my third year. Third year going to the Crawling for Cops. Yeah. Right on. And then Women's Wheeling Day 2019. They just set the date yesterday. That's September 28th. 
this will be my gosh since 2014 fifth year um i'm heading out to uari again to wheel with carolina trails off road if they'll still have me <laughs> that's what i was thinking. um <laughs> No, but actually one of their guys went and wheeled at Roush Creek and he was um, very surprised at how difficult it was comparatively. Um, but the other thing is I came um, out of work today and I had to do the old Fonzarelli act on my headlight again. <laughs> oh, I knew that was going to so happen. So I might just trade out my headlights for the ones I have sitting over here on the shelf. Um, but I also wanted to shout out to Dan Cole at the 4x4 podcast. <laughs> I was listening today. Yes, my shackle was stolen. Yes, it was. Um, Dan's on board. He knows. Yes. They were, <laughs> knows they the were, truth. <laughs> knows the truth. The real story. We're Apparently, referring- there's, um, I, they're talking about, and I want to tell the story because Tony's going to tell it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a red Jeep involved. <laughs> um, I went to the grocery store one day, went in, got my groceries, came back out, and one of my shackles was missing. And I swear to God, somebody stole it. Everyone else thinks that it just rattled off as I'm going down a paved road to the grocery store. Um, but anyway, so Dan on the 4x4 podcast, he and his... Um, hosts were talking about SEMA and some of the awesome products they had there. And one of them was a lock for your shackle. And that's when Dan brought up that maybe that's what I should get so people won't steal my shackles. Yeah, you guys uh, should, Attaboy, go over there, should go over there and listen to episode uh, 140, 140 of uh, the uh, the 4x4 podcast. Uh, I didn't think you had the episode, Tammy. That's why I was jumping in there with the episode number. But oh, yeah, uh, no, yeah. it was it was fun. Uh, it was fun to hear that. I'm, I'm cruising along in the Jeep and then Dan starts uh, talking about uh, uh, the Jeep talk show and Tammy and her uh, quote unquote stolen D ring. <laughs> it's like, yes. <laughs> I, I will not ever admit that it just rattled off. I just don't believe it. Yeah, you got to tighten those things up. They're super tight now. Now I can't get them off. <laughs> So I uh, I don't know if I if I mentioned this on a prior show. Uh, my um, I have a uh, I redid the the exhaust system on my Jeep and anything that was uh, was welded I unwelded it and uh, fixed it uh, where I could uh, put clamps on it because I didn't want to have to go to a muffler shop. The last muffler shop that I went to uh, didn't like them. They didn't do the job right, and uh, I'd just rather do it my own damn self. So, uh, where the, uh, and, and keep in mind, I, I, and maybe this is why you're supposed to weld, uh, exhaust stuff, but I, I crank the hell out of the, the clamp and actually move the clamp so that it doesn't hang down. You know, it's like when you're going over things off road, it doesn't hang on things. Uh, but I cranked the hell out of that, uh, that U bolt, uh, that U clamp that's on there, but it still came apart. So, uh, I think, uh, it may be because, um, the downpipe rattles on the cross member. And what I'm going to do is uh, I may not be able to keep it from coming apart, uh, but I can definitely keep it from uh, swinging side to side and hitting the drive shaft like it did this this last time a couple of weeks ago if I put a hanger in there. So I've, I've purchased a couple of exhaust hangers from Amazon, and uh, I'm going to put a couple of bolts in the, the floor of the Jeep and uh, bolt the, the half of it uh, uh, up in the... Uh, what do you call that the 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 tunnel? What do you call that, Josh? Is it the the transmission tunnel? Yeah, but I'm, I'm curious as to as uh, it sounds like you're missing the same hanger that I just had put back into no, my Jeep. There's a hanger there, but the damn thing keeps bending down and it starts bouncing on top of the uh, the 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 cross member. And we're talking about a, a Cherokee uh, guys, a '97 plus Cherokee. Uh, and uh, that hanger that is a part of the downpipe, uh, the the one that I I had prior, I, I mentioned this to you in chat. It actually tore. It actually ripped the metal open uh, from me uh, taking a jack and pushing the uh, the exhaust up to try to get it off the cross member so it wouldn't be rattling. And I think that that uh, pushing it up every so often uh, eventually tore the 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 pipe. So what I'm trying what I'm going to do is if I put the hanger there. Uh, it may not get it off of the, the cross member, but if nothing else, it's going to uh, keep it from uh, moving around if it comes off again. I don't mind the noise. 
I just want to be able to, to drive it without having to worry about it run, rubbing against things, especially that beautiful Tom Woods drive shaft I have on there. I'm, I'm curious if your rear exhaust hanger, the, that the rubber um, connector point is, is stretched out and it's causing your exhaust to essentially droop. And so you, you're, you're fine on that, on that central connection point, but in the, in the back, you're stretched out a little bit. And so it's causing it to droop and that's why you're resting on your cross member. Because that, 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 that central uh, mounting point shouldn't bend. I mean, that is at least half inch solid steel dowel. If that's bending, then it was already bent because of an accident or something that you got caught up on. That's well, not is, something that is, is bendable. Yeah, this is new. Uh, it's a new piece that I've had for probably less mm. than a year. So yeah. stretch, no. Uh, no, I don't, I don't see that any of that is, is uh, germane to, the, to this situation. Anyway, I don't, I don't, putting the hanger on there, I think it might keep it up uh, off the uh, off the cross member better. Seems like an, an, an a rather invasive solution, but I wish you luck, sir. Thank you. Well, um, having that thing swing and 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 run into uh, actually rub on the uh, <laughs> rub on the uh, uh, the rear drive shaft is uh, is more invasive than what I'll be doing here. Well, yeah, that's a that's a lot of excessive movement that the the system was never designed for. Well, imagine if you will the the exhaust gets really loud, and I'm like, you know, you're driving along and it's it's wet out, it's all rainy, so I, I don't know whether I should uh, pull over and look at it, and I say, well. No, the exhaust probably uh, the 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 where it goes into the collector, it probably dropped off, and that's all it is. So as long as I don't hear any metal scraping, and then I make I take a turn and I start hearing metal metal scraping, I go, what the hell's going uh, on? And it, it took me a good uh, I was about uh, half a mile from the office, so uh, and I'm driving and it, and every time I would take a turn, uh, you'd hear this metal scraping, and I'm th- just sitting there trying to think what in the world could that be. And then it dawned on me. I said, oh, I know where it came apart, but I still don't know why, what's scraping. And it wasn't until I got into the parking garage and I could see. Uh, I looked over there, and there was the, the drive shaft. And even though I didn't see any, any damage to the drive shaft, it made sense. It was swinging that way, and I could tell. So, Wow. Anyway, I want to put that hanger in there, and I, th- I think it'll be just fine. Uh, I don't uh, – uh, you know, when you make modifications, it's, it, it just happens. You know, it, unexplained oh, yeah. things no, – I've- unexplained things happen and i don't know i agree with you it's, this shouldn't be something i need to do but if nothing else like i said it, it'll keep it off of something uh in the future and if i'm off road and I, I drag it over something it comes apart it'll be the, just that much easier and that uh much less damage uh, t- to the exhaust system mm-hmm. well do you want to join in on a campfire side chat Crack an adult beverage, pull up a chair, and join us in on the fun. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and find out all the ways you can reach out to us and join in. FM Jeeper, in appreciation of your several calls to the show, we'd like to offer you a subscription to Jeep Action Magazine. It's a beautiful magazine with great information and stories. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact to find out how to contact us. And now let's get to some events from around the world and maybe in your neck of the woods. Let us know about an event that you know about or have coming up or that you have planned. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact, click and fill out our wheeling wear form. The information will come to us and we will get it out to the public. Coming up February 1st through the 9th, just around the corners, you know it, you love it. It's the king of the hammers, everybody. Johnson Valley, California, the only place at the hammer town it happens Oh, you got to go check it out. For more information, ultra4racing.com. Uh, Badlands Off-Road Adventures presents the Tire Repair and High Lift Mini Clinic. This is really cool, happening February 2nd at Borrego Springs, California. And uh, for more information on these events or any of the others, well, be sure to go check out our website. And hey, don't forget the big international desert race. The Dakar Rally is happening right now, live with never-before-seen level coverage. Go check it out by Googling Dakar Race or by going to www.dakar.com. That's D-A-K-A-R, by the way. So for more information on these events or others, click and visit the jeeptalkshow.com website for this episode. That's it for the show for this week, fellow Jeeper. Until next week, be sure to like and friend us on Facebook. And as always, thank you for listening to the world's most downloaded podcast. Now, if I didn't know it before, I sure do now. I mean, there's only so many times you can pull your own finger before something's going to get stuck. Podcasting since 2010.